pleasure to welcome Dr. Laura Mayorga. Um, Dr. Mayorga is a staff scientist at Johns Hopkins University in the Applied Physics Lab. And her work uh, focuses on studies of objects both within and outside of our solar system. Uh, she received her PhD from New Mexico State University in 2017 and was a fellow at the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard before arriving at Hopkins. So uh, Dr. Mayorga, I will turn it over to you and thank you so much for talking to us today. Absolutely. Um, so I'm assuming my slides are good and everyone can hear me just fine. Great. Yep, thank I can you. hear you and see your uh, mouse as well. Excellent. All right. So today I'll be talking about um, this paper that we just got accepted on the uh, planetary infrared excess technique um, as we tested it around or using the TRAPPIST-1 system um, as our test bed. Uh, so this was work that we did as part of the CHAMS collaboration. So this was an ICAR award that we received with a number of institute partner institutions. Um, this is the Consortium on Habitability and, Astros and Atmospheres of M-Dwarf Planets. And so TRAPPIST-1, of course, is what we're going to be talking about today. But this effort is led by uh, Kevin Stevenson, who's here, and of course, Ravi, who's there. So I'm sure you've heard all about it. Um, so just to explain what the planetary infrared excess is, in case you haven't heard about it yet, uh, the initial concept was conceived by uh, Kevin in 2020, where, you know, typically with like the transit method, radio velocity method, right, this requires having sort of the star and the planet separated in time, right? So with a transit or with, a, with an eclipse, for example, right, you know, this is the star only, or this is... Um, and so the planet is gone, and so you have this sort of like um, a point of reference essentially for when you're seeing only the planet or when what the planet's flux should be. What the planetary infrared excess does is it sort of borrows ideas from uh, the discovery of like circumstellar disks, for example, and in binary stars, where instead of having this point in time as your reference for what the planet flux should be, you have this point in wavelength space of reference. So here's this little diagram from that initial paper where you have, for example, some sort of stellar uh, system flux, which is the orange line here, and the star's flux is, is only this blue line. But because of the deep infrared where your planet um, is, is, you know, it, its black body, for example, is peaking there, um, this is exaggerated by a thousand times, there would be this contribution from the planet um, out of these wavelengths that was then called the planetary infrared excess. Um, and so that was the initial concept in 2020. There's been, of course, expansions on this work um, as uh, last year or so. And so we have got three works here that I just want to walk through real quick. So Jake Lissadiger expanded on this and looked at WASP-43b with JWST. He actually simulated a planet atmosphere, did some retrievals using a Phoenix stellar grid um, to pr uh, prove out the technique a little bit more. And Avi, who I think I just saw, also hopped onto the call, led a paper where they looked at Proxima Send B with the miracle concept and actually and did some simulated planet atmosphere retrievals as well. And then this is actually expand um, outside of sort of M, you know, M dwarf main sequence stars um, with Marianne Limbach uh, last year, who also looked at planets around white dwarves with JWST data and did some signal to noise calculations to sort of show that this was a promising technique for those particular host stars. Uh, so what hasn't been shown yet, and this is, of course, the perfect time for the slides to freeze. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so what hasn't been shown yet is uh, whether, I'll just keep talking, whether uh, pi works in the case of whether you have multiple planets around the same star, and especially in TRAPPIST-1, where the system is very compact, can you pull out the uh, different uh, planetary signals in a compact system like that? There we go. OK. So here's the case, for example, for TRAPPIST-1 and what we did in this paper. So we basically simplified the whole planet system back down to just simple black bodies. So we have a black body star with black body planets. We didn't assume um, any sort of realistic activity or anything like that for the star, just simple black bodies. Can we separate out the planets? Um, so the figure on the left, you see the same sort of flux as a function of wavelength here. And so the black is just the star. And then as we add each of the planets, and since they're much smaller, we're multiplying by other significant factors, to sort of see them here on this chart. You see where each of their different black bodies peaks um, and their sort of contribution to the overall system signal. And just for reference here, I've put sort of the wavelength range of MIRI LRS as well as the miracle concept. And so what we've done here is, is we've just sort of used a simplified 
multi-planet system, right? Where we just take the flux of the system to be the additive flux from all the bodies in the system. And then for our scheme, what we've done is, is we've used um, the, an albedo, a radius, and a semi-major axis for each of the planets um, in order to both model the system and then as we test how well the PI technique works on the, in this sort of scenario, um, those are also are going to be our retrieval parameters. So you could imagine in a multi-planet system like this, there's of course like you know seven factorial or more possible combinations of what you could test. You could test, you know, what if this planet is transiting, or what if this planet is eclipsing, or or what if this I had a similar system that had only two planets or three planets, which two, which three, right? You could imagine this would be an infinite. Um, an easily overwhelming um, sort of parameter space to try to examine where pi would um, succeed or fail. And so what we ended up doing is trying to instead tackle the system in historical context. So let's say, you know, back before the discovery of Trappist B, C, and D, et cetera, um, what if we had just gotten an observation of the star? How would pi do? And then as the discovery of the system unfolds, how would that additional information we gain help pi? and constrain the actual parameters of the planets here. So what we're going to do um, to test pi here is we're going to model the presently known system, so that will be the Eagle et al. 2021 20, parameters, as our data, the synthetic data that we're going to use. And then we're going to use a nested sampling algorithm to explore the system possibilities. And then through history, as we gain ad additional information, you know, refinements on the star, refinements on the various planet properties, we'll use that information as the known priors in the model um, for the nested sampling algorithm. And then, of course, since in the beginning, for example, we don't know how many planets there are, we'll test multiple planet scenarios and then evaluate those fits to either discover or characterize the planets that are in the system. So for those of you that may not be familiar with nested sampling, um, it's very similar to like a Markov chain Monte Carlo, with the exception being that instead of, you know, having little walkers and then they, you know, um, are sort of exploring your little parameter space with this given step size and for a given amount of time, right? A nested sampling algorithm instead uses live points that it just randomly distributes throughout the space. And then at each sort of step, it says who's the worst, who has the worst likelihood and moves that point until it is no longer the worst likelihood. And so you end up um, sort of exploring the space through these sort of likelihood shells, always pushing your live points all the way down um, into uh, an area of the highest likelihood. Okay. Okay. Uh, so here's sort of the timeline of the Trappist one that we considered. So back in 2015, all we knew about was the star, and so we'll we'll examine pi in sort of that scenario. Um, and then in 2016, right, we had the first Guillaume publication with B and C and then some suggestions for planet D. And then in 2017, we had all seven uh, discovered with sort of H still being a little bit uncertain as far as its, uh, you know, more precise properties. There was some pretty big error bars in the period, for example. And then, of course, present day. Uh, is what we're calling it um, for the Eagle et al. 2021 parameters. And just as a reminder, this, those parameters are what we use to actually initialize the system. So I'm showing those here um, uh, just for reference. And so what we did is that I think in the Eagle et al. work, they actually assumed an albedo of zero. We just go ahead and gave it the planets an albedo of 0.1, which of course changes our temperatures, um, but just so that we wouldn't have like an answer that it's at the edge of the physical bounds, just so we could see um, um, more precisely like how, how pi would actually be able to constrain such a value like that. Different from zero on the edge of the bounds, so we could actually get like, you know, errors. Um, that are a little bit more symmetric. And so those are just the properties there. I just wanted to show you there, uh, those there for completeness. And then throughout, um, just to sort of give you a sense of how well we're doing, I'll be showing the figures like this. So this is a star and of course each of the planets here um, and their, you know, the distances and their sizes are proportional to their actual values. And so we'll be comparing our sort of best fit um, ideas of the system against sort of this picture. And of course, um, we need some sort of observation of style to test this on. So in the initial uh, conceived work by Kevin, um, there it, it became sort of uh, 
uh, optimal to consider, you know, the range, the wavelength range of which you're observing the system is going to have some bearing on what planets you'll be able to characterize. So like, for example, you want to make sure the peak flux from that planet is, for example, in your wavelength window, right? Otherwise, you'll struggle a little bit to actually be able to characterize it. So what we started with is a sort of uh, miracle-like observation. So the miracle concept um, is ranges and wavelengths from about one micron to 18 microns. And so this, for example, sets sort of that peak or, or that range of same major axes by proxy of temperature that we could hopefully um, find planets at. We use an R of about 100, and then we had an artificial noise floor of five parts per million. Now, what we actually did with this noise floor is that it's a noise floor, like in the sense of calculating the likelihood of like sticking a, a sigma in there, but it's not, we didn't actually add a noise realization to our data, but looking at the residuals, for example, of our um, fits, and uh, you know, if it's an excess of the noise floor, like that's indicative of, of, of um, a suboptimal fit. And so as we go through this, as I said, you know, we gain information, um, but in, in the cases where we don't have any additional information, like in the example, but we're about to see where it was just the star, right? When we go blindly looking for planets, we use these priors here on the same major axis, this derived from our wavelength, and then we just assume um, two priors here on the uh, radius of the planet. So we're only looking for things up to two Earth radii. Of course, we could have gone bigger, um, but that's just what we chose to do. And then the prior on the albedo is, of course, the natural zero to one. Are there any questions at this time? I can monitor the chat. So if someone has a question doesn't entirely feel like interrupting me, please use the chat. All right. So that's the setup that we took. Um, so we're using a miracle-like observation, um, and we'll be tracking TRAPPIST-1 through time. So here we start. We start here with the Philip Hazo et al. 2015 um, knowledge of the system. And so as we track through um, my little slides, you'll see we have this bar here sort of uh, that corresponds to these different time periods. And so you'll always know sort of where we are in the timeline as I go through these slides. So to start, we'll be looking at just the star only that we knew about. And so that's the one that is highlighted on this bar. So in 2015, Philip Hazelodov published the, this paper, which referred to TRAPPIST-1 as we know it now as this two mass phone number. Um, so in this time period, we had uh, a constraint on the temperature of the star, that was Cecily, um, and the radius of the star, also noted here. So the first test, of course, we should do is say, you know, if this had just been the star only, um, and there were no planets around it, you know, what would Pi have retrieved, right? So if we just said um, there is, this is a planet-free star, right? The system flux is easy to build. And so this is what we've built here in this purple case. And you see, we get a retrieved value for the star um, and stellar parameters as shown here in the purple. So it's a really precise constraint, of course, because we're kind of working in the noise regime and you can see the residuals here are very low. So this is a star that is constructed with the Eagle 2021 parameters, but with no planets. And so using what we're actually going to be using for the, the rest of the study, right, an actual planet host or planet hosting star, that's the orange. Um, no, I don't, and yeah, yeah, that's the orange, but fitting only for the star in this scenario of what we knew at the time, right? So if the planets are here, but we only fit for the star, that's where we get the orange parameters, right? So naturally, because there is Additional flux here, you know, the, the model is trying to say, oh, maybe I need a little bit bigger star and a little bit hotter star to account for this extra flux. But you can see in the residuals, this is very much in excess of that five parameter or five part per million noise floor, which would indicate to us that maybe there is some additional flux in the system. So now we undertake sort of a blind search for planets um, with the knowledge that we know here in 2015. So now we pretend that we're scientists in 2015 and trying to find planets around the star. Um, so to evaluate these models, we're using the uh, evidence. So in nest sampling, or sorry, in, in Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, what you're really doing is you're exploring your sort of 2D posterior, or 2D multiple dimension um, posteriors of, and so through that exploration, right, we sort of end up being like, okay, this is sort of the, 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 the best value and sort of with all my little 1D posteriors, I end up finding like, you know, the, the error bars on that value, for example. But the what nested sampling is actually trying to do is compute this evidence number. 
And so this calculating of the evidence um, allows you to compare different model assumptions um, as long as you're using the same data, like through time, basically. And so instead of using like a bit comparison or an eight comparison or something like that, this this what NISA sampling is actually trying to do is get at this evidence number that we can then compare. Um, and so this table here on the right is just showing how you can take that evidence um, and compare it to like the, or in, in its equivalency with like the p-value or the base factor. And then eventually what we sort of like talking about as scientists, which is the sigma significance. So the 2 d posterior is of course, um, fallout of nested sampling, but it's actually trying to get at this evidence number, which is kind of nice. So what we're looking at is we'll, we'll test different numbers of plants in the system. We'll look at the evidence uh, of each of those models. And then there will be obviously one that is the most optimal. And then we'll look within three sigma of the optimal value to see the range of possible planets that we would um, predict in the system. Uh, so the best fit is the number of models or is the number of planets in the model with the highest evidence and then the error on that number is going to be determined by which ones are in that sort of three sigma range. So here's what it's going to look like. So um, we'll be showing, I'll be showing a couple of these throughout the talk. So we have the true system down here at the bottom, right? So the, the, the sizes are corresponding to the radii and then the color here is corresponding to the set albedo. Remember we set it at 0.1. And then for the model with one planet, for example, here's the one planet model. Here's where one planet would fall. I'm showing the error bar here on the same major axis, but I can't show it to you for the error bar on the albedo and the radius just because the way it's uh, plotted here. And then here I'll be showing the evidence closer to zero is better. And then the significance of this model and sigma from the best fit model. So there's one planet. There's a model with two planets. So you can see here the model with two planets actually ended up being the most preferred model. And so that you see that this one planet one is actually not. Um, it's not uh, within the three sigma range, so it's disfavored. And we can go up to three planets as we're blindly searching around this planet or the star, remember? Four planets, five planets, and so on and so forth, all the way up to nine planets. So we, as you look through here, the ones that are uh, sort of uh, not transparent, the highlighted ones, are the ones that all fall within three sigma. Now, the other thing you should note is, of course, that, you know, there's nine planets jam packed in the system. The error bars and some major axes are pretty wide, but uh, we did not evaluate any of these systems for like stability or longevity or anything like that. Um, we're just letting, just going purely off of sort of the fluxes of what could potentially be possible in the system. So of course, we can keep on packing planets in there um, um, and they wouldn't be physical, but that's just, uh, but we, so we didn't do any checks like that. Uh, so that's just the one little caveat here when you start looking at really high, uh, high number of planets in a system. And so you can see here, based on sort of the the uh, significance of each particular model, we would say um, that there are probably at least two planets in the system. Uh, they have, would have seven major axes such as these, but probably no more than seven, because that was outside of the three sigma sort of window. And so based on the sort of the properties we would find, right, we have a seven major axis, we have a, a radius here for those two planets, but more importantly, using the best known stellar mass at the time, right, we would get periods. And so these periods, for example, would be sort of the basis for a search for transits, for example, around this star. So here's that little diagram I was showing you earlier. So of course, the colored circles are the true system, and those are the true system parameters here. And these gray circles, uh, dash circles here, are what we would say would have been what we thought what the system would actually look like from our results of pi. All right, I see no questions in the chat. Let's continue forward. So we're jumping ahead now to the after Guillaume et al. 2016. Now in 2016, this is straight out of his publication here, uh, of the parameters for B and C. And you can see for D that there was a lot of possible options. Of course, in retrospect, it's funny to look back at this and see, oh, you know, this is actually a lot like the period of D. And this is like the period of B and so on and so forth. Um, but they gave a sort of preferred period for D, which is actually close to the period for H, which is kind of funny in, in retrospect. Um, they did give the full sort of semi-major axis wavelength range that they thought there could be uh, here for planet D, but the uh, radius parameter was actually um, calculated on the base that this, that this was the correct period. Um, so for our cases, you know, let's pretend that we couldn't talk to them at the time, you know, we're just like, oh, we'll just see what we can find out. And after seeing this publication in 2016 for this system. So this 
it presents this caveat of whether we should use this as a prior for our explorations of potentially what the system is or not, right? And so that ends up with a couple of different um, test case scenarios for, for um, looking at the system in 2016. So in 2016, right, they had uh, a new constraint on the, the star. So we use that now. Um, and you can see we have a new constraint on the radius as well. We use the known information from B and C from that paper. And then for D, of course, we have the options. So we can say, we can start off with saying, um, you know, I, I want to believe only the prior that they placed on the same major axis. So that's this one here. Um, I could say, you know, that I only want to believe the prior that they put on the radius and still use the the broad semi axis prior, or I can say maybe that and it, because that one didn't do as well in comparison to this first one here, maybe an extra plant needs to be there. Uh, my um, Laura? There Laura, we go. I, I lost. Oh, okay, there we go. I yeah, my headset turned off. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we heard you for most of this, and then it just cut off there at the very end. Yeah, I heard the beep, and I was like, wait. <laughs> All right. Uh, so given that this this particular case where we believe their prior on the radius didn't do so well, I was like, well, maybe this is the right radius and, you know, an extra planet needs to be there. And obviously you can get carried away doing these kinds of, you know, what could be a possible um, solution. So, of course, the last one up here is I don't believe any of their numbers and I'm just going to blindly search for a third planet given what we know about B and C. Um, so uh, let me see here. Now that I've clicked off the slides. All right, yeah, so believe nothing. <laughs> and what would I get? And of course, you can go further with believe nothing and just keep adding plants to the system like we did before, and you end up getting something like this, um, which is sort of interesting to look at. So um, obviously, knowing that that, in retrospect, right, hindsight 2020, that their radius they wanted um, for D was based on an incorrect period, um, it's kind of funny to see that that's actually reflected here and that the pie sort of disfavors that solution as well, which is kind of nice. Um, the best fit pie uh, result at this point, which is more, even more interesting, is that it actually wants four planets in here um, when we start blindly searching for additional planets. And so you can see that based off of the significance here. The highlighting here is the same. Um, and so if, if we had published sort of like, oh, this is our pie, results on, on the TRAPPIST-1 system, it's interesting to see that we would have been in contention with their assumptions on D, um, but we would support, of course, additional plants in the systems. That's sort of fun and interesting. Now, um, I, I wanted to stop here for a second and just say, obviously, this is a highly multimodal and degenerate problem, right? Multiple planets. Uh, we did impose like constraints to make sure that there weren't any identity issues or anything in the, in the retrievals. Um, but you know, given that there's a whole slew of you know combinations you can imagine that would fit this kind of data set, I don't want to give anybody the um, impression that these are like perfect residual free like results, right? So like the solutions are multimodal and degenerate, and of course not very nice, right? And so you know all of this sort of comes with a grain of salt of like. Um, you know, once you have actual atmospheres, for example, and actual absorption lines, you know, maybe some of this would clean up a little bit because, you know, those have to be assigned to a particular planet with bigger quantity, but of course that presents its own additional complexity of like who, which planet has which set of molecules, for example, right? And so I just don't want to give anyone the impression that like, you know, all of these best fits, if you will, from each planet scenario or each number of planets, for example, is like a perfect clean answer. They all look kind of ready like this. Uh, so we will be looking at this again once we actually start looking at sort of the, the 2017 and 2021 um, pi analyses and see how that compares. Okay. So for 2016, we would say there are three to seven plants in the system, but we think four is best, best and that we also don't believe uh, perhaps their radius on D. These are the semi or the semi axes and the radii that we would assume for those planets. Um, and then the uh, periods here that we can go searching for. Um, here's a diamond across, across the bottom here. The red circles are now sort of like the prior information, right? What they thought for B and C is shown in red. And then this is the sort of semi-major axis range that they thought additional planet D would be in. 
Um, and then the gray circles, of course, are of what we think the system is. Um, so as I mentioned before, you know, 2020 hindsight, um, it's fun to see how the actual periods line up for of what the ones that they thought were in that um, work and to see that our, our assumption of, you know, what D and what we would be calling E at this case are actually something that's pretty similar to D and F. So that's kind of fun. All right, moving forward, it's now 2017. Um, and Guillaume et al. have published this lovely table of all seven planets um, in the system now. And so you see we have pretty trite constraints on most of their uh, periods at this point, right? Um, with the exception of H. So now we want to see, you know, does pi, using pi, help us get a better constraint on H over than what's actually in here? So just to sort of show you, whoops, there we go. Um, here we have all the same priors as before. Now we're using those priors on H. Um, and here is actually what the retrieval looks like. So I showed you in the four planet blind search from 2016 that it was pretty messy and ratty. Um, and now you see here in 2017, you know, a lot of these are starting to look much nicer, Gaussian, you know, happy, happy statistics um, are, uh, looks a lot better here. H is the one, the set of parameters that's all the way down here. Um, here are the residuals. You can see they fall well within the noise floor. And so this is, of course, much more confident sort of pi result. After 2017, this is what we would say. Uh, again, red circles are sort of what the best guess of the, the known values were at the time as published. And then the gray uh, dash lot circles would be what pi would say. And then, of course, at this point, someone probably has the question of why do neither of those line up with the actual circles, which is the best fit 2021. Recall that, um, of course, our knowledge of the star is improving over time. And so um, the seven major axes, the, the periods, right, is dependent on that stellar mass value. And as well, Eagle 2021, um, of course, included all the, you know, the transit timing variations and the effects that the planets have on each other. Um, all the, the, you know, the two to three period ratios and all that kind of stuff. And so we're just assuming circular orbits, right, when we're going from um, period and semi axis. So of course, that's not included in either of those works. OK, moving on. So of course, present day, all 2021, you know, given all the right answers, what does pi get us over what is uh, what we already know? So here's all the Eagle at all 2021. Recall that we set the albedo to be 0.1 rather than zero and are assuming circular orbits, which of course um, that was uh, treated much more carefully. The orbits of, of and uh, transit timings of the various in the system were treated much more carefully by the Eagle at all 2021 work. And so here is um, what we would get. So I'm not showing the red anymore because that is the, the actual colored circles. And so here's our radii line up pretty much perfectly for almost everybody. And then this little gray bar here that I'm now showing that I hadn't been showing before is the error that we would say um, on each of the sub major axes. So just to compare those two, right? The only real difference between the sort of the Eagle and, and Guion works there um, are the sort of the constraints on H, right? Um, and sort of the the tightness of the the, the errors, if you will, on any of the other planet properties. And so you can see here now, I'm showing it to you how I had been doing it before when we were testing all the different planet cases, but it's just these two. And so you cannot, do not compare the evidences here. Um, they're just being shown because it's a remnant of the code. Um, so the error bars for the same axis you can see are very tight here. And then H is still sort of a little bit broad given that the priors we had on H. Now at this point, it's you start to realize that pi is very prior driven in this system. Um, so you can see over time, so here's the 2015 best fit result, the 2016 best fit result, so on and so forth until the 2021, that the priors on the same major axis really do drive the result as retrieved from using pi on the system. So it's a little bit, um, well, let me explain this figure. So we have the different best fits from each of sort of our stages in time. Across the bottom, we have the major axis of each of the, uh, each of the planets. So each planet has its own color right here. Um, and then 
across the top, these little ticks are, of course, the correct values. And then our, our 1D posteriors, of course, are the histograms. And then the dashed dotted lines that you can barely see here are what our like, best fit value would be as retrieved. The gray lines here are what the priors actually are. So in the, in the initial case, when we didn't know anything, right, the plier, they're uniform flat priors. And so you just see the sort of line and then you don't see the edges on Likehorn. We had like a Gaussian prior. And so you see the nice little Gaussian here. So you can see though, like for take, for example, you know, 2017 or even 2016, right? The, it has a hard time like adjusting the sim major axis towards the real answer because that seems to be extremely prior dependent, right? I mean, this Gaussian here is that big wide Gaussian on H. And like, this is only truncated here because we set the requirement that, you know, the planets can't step all over each other and end up, you know, switching places in sim major axis. We've made that a rule that they had to always occur in order, right? And so that's the only reason why like H doesn't end up following that. And so you see, right, the sim major axis in particular is very prior dependent on what you already know. Now, interestingly, of course, the radius would then have to try to compensate for this. So this is the same plot, but instead of showing you the radius now, um, and so it's hard to see in this particular diagram, um, but you can see that this sort of example, this prior here, you can see that our actual retrieved posterior doesn't necessarily line up with it, right? So it's like the radius and the albedo end up trying to compensate for the, our inability to step out of the sim major axis prior that we have. What that does mean, though, is because the radius and the albedo are trying to compensate for this, our equilibrium temperatures that we derive are not prior dependent. Now, we didn't fit for the equilibrium temperature, of course. But what you can do is you can take the priors from the radius and the albedo uh, and the symmetry axis and like compute what would be your prior on the equilibrium temperature. And so that's what's shown here on these sort of like uh, the gray lines here, what the what that sort of derived prior would be. And then what our sort of, again, doing that same sort of calculation, posterior would be on that equilibrium temperature. And so you can see here, based on the right answers, which are the little tick lines across the top right, um, we're actually doing a pretty good job at constraining an equilibrium temperature over that prior. Um, so you can see, particularly even in 2017, right, where sort of H is still particularly unknown, this is actually pretty good. Um, in comparison to that, where that prior would have actually tried to tell you that H would actually fall. Um, so quickly now, just to sort of finish up, um, of course, everyone wants to know, what about with JWST, t right, which is actually flying right now, and of course, with a more realistic noise um, realization. So just to sort of recap a little bit, um, oh, I forgot to change this. No, <laughs> for James D, it's not go from 1 to 18. Um, it goes, uh, you know, from from 3 to 14 or something. Um, and then because of that, right, that sets a, a much narrower sort of same image axis window where we would hope to catch like the peak of a planet's black body. Um, we kept the R of 100 and then we had different noise floors. So we tried a 5, a 10, 100 part per million noise floor. And so to do that, what we did is we took the um, stellar flux and we just said, OK, every point has a 5 part per million or 10 part per million noise floor. Um, what we did is we actually did a 1 part per million noise floor and then scaled that to each of the 5, 10, 100 parts per million just so that everyone would have the exact same random noise um, realization. So I'm just showing that visually to you here. Like, what would that noise look like on just the, like, if I took out the star, stellar flux in the system, just sort of the additive planetary flux here for 5, 10 hundreds per million. Um, and then of course, how that compares to like the, the noise floor of the five, 10, hundred parts per million. Um, so you could do sort of, you can go through the whole thing again, right? You can say, okay, what would I do in 2015? How would I do in 2016, 2017? So here's 2015, for example. Um, so if you were just trying to fit a star in 2015, right, you'd get pretty nice um, precise results on the stellar parameters. What I didn't point out, and actually I should have pointed this out, is we, we've we've always been using the Eagle 2021 at all um, parameters to make our synthetic data, right? And we have actually always been retrieving as our best fit stellar parameters, those parameters. Like no matter what the priors were, we were always getting the star really well. And so you can see that that's sort of still continually the case here. Um, even when we aren't fitting or aren't getting the, the or aren't including planets in our retrieval. 
which is kind of nice that that's at least, you know, really robust and not really much of a concern in this particular design, uh, experimental setup. Uh, so of course, now testing that with noise, uh, with JVST, um, for the in in looking for planets around the 2015 uh, uh, two mass star, not Trappist one yet. Um, this gray dashed line here just shows you where the sort of the limits of the extent of the blind search that we're doing because of that limitation of the wavelength range of the JVST Mary instrument. And so you see that we're not really going to be capturing G and H. Um, so in, in the results that we get based on the noise is a little bit different in each scenario. So for example, in the most precise scenario, two planets still ends up being sort of the optimal um, interpretation of the system, which was the same as Miracle um, with that no noise floor. That's still true in the 10 part per million scenario. And then of course, 100 part per million, we can no longer say um, you know, the, that that is true. So now we want down to one planet. One planet was, was also allowed in, in the 10 part per million case, but not in the 5 part per million case, up to four planets, right? So this sort of range is just dependent on like what, you know, the particular, what ends up being allowed in the, that particular model scenario. But you can see how our interpretation would change based on this, how much noise is actually in our data. Um, so here, that's just to show you what that would look like um, uh, compared against the actual system. And so looking at 2017, right, I'm just going to skip 2016 for time. Looking at 2017 here, where we had um, uh, some knowledge, but not very precise knowledge on H, you can see how that um, makes a, a affects the different um, models here. Um, what is interesting, too, is that even though G falls as sort of outside that like blind search wavelength range that we're using, we can still sort of tell it's there. Um, again, this is very prior driven, right? So even though it's not perfectly captured in JBS T, of course, it, it does show up in the model. Um, and so it can sort of be fit for given those priors. Um, I wanted to show you uh, what those sort of posteriors would actually look like from our best fits. So I switched this on you, sorry. The the black line is the the real answer now. And then this colored solid line is what we got. Um, so this is the 100 parts per million, the, the worst noise sort of realization. And so you see, again, you know, we don't really have good constraints on albedo and everything else is basically um, following the prior, right? Um, so we don't really have a constraints on some of these things, maybe the equilibrium temperature is more constrained than if we didn't have to use this at all. Um, but everything else is pretty prior constrained or, or prior dependent or not constrained. Um, going to sort of that more precise scenario, the 10 part per million case, right? Maybe we can start saying some, something about the albedo is constrained, but you can still see semi-draxis is still very prior dependent. Uh, maybe the radius is becoming less so, which is good. And then the equilibrium temperature is maybe becoming more constrained. And so then, of course, the most precise scenario. And you can see that a lot of things are a lot more constrained. Um, semi Semidraxis will always be kind of prior dependent, but everything else would be less so. So that's just sort of the effect of, of what noise does to this kind of analysis. So just to finish, uh, wrap up here. Um, you know, in, in non-transiting situations, right, we didn't use any transit information. We didn't use any eclipse information. It's really just assuming that they're all random, like in their orbits, right? This is what their black bodies are. Pi can figure out that there is something, that it's not just a solo star, that there are probably planets in the system. And then the blind search for planets, right, is going to end up being sensitive to the wavelength range of your inst instrument. Um, in the Trappist one system, right, we assumed everything was black bodies, everything's circular orbits, right? Multiply this sort of multiply technique struggles to constrain that semi axis, right? Without those strong priors, it's very prior dependent for that particular parameter, um, and less so for others, which is promising for being able to determine the equilibrium temperature of known planets and maybe even unknown planets in these systems. So, uh, the Trappist one case, uh, very highly compact, difficult system you could imagine for for a technique like this, but um, it does have uh, some additional information that we could potentially gain out of it. Uh, so with that, I thank you all for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Great, Laura, that was an awesome talk. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, we have time for questions. So feel free to raise your hand or you can post them in chat and I can read them off. Let's see. 
I can uh, kick us off with one. Um, so just based off uh, um, from what I understood, um, you know, looking at the JWST noise floor, this technique seems to be very good for short period systems. And like you were saying, ones that are ideally not super compact. So you don't have a lot of those orbiting orbital effects causing uh, uh, differences. Is there any other kind of ideal target to apply this method to? Like if you're looking for, if, if we are at the 2015 mark now and you're looking through the Exoplanet Archive, you know, what systems are you excited about applying this to to look for unknown planets? Yeah, I mean, it, it the M dwarf stars, like they, it is a sort of complex, you know, combination of factors, right? They tend to have a small planets. They tend to be a little bit more compact systems, right? Um, but small stars, you know, the, the solar neighborhood is full of these small stars. So like for getting like the sort of the highest signal to noise on actual flexes, right? Like you end up trying to look for those nearby stars. And so I think in some senses, the solar neighborhood and M dwarfs is like the perfect place to look, even though it has this caveat of having, you know, this potential highly compact, very small planet systems. That being said, though, Trappist one is unique in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, maybe it, it actually isn't that scary. Um, you know, Marianne Limbach has been doing some of this white dwarf host planet work as well. Um, and so white dwarfs are also another very complex sort of, you know, trying to understand the demographics of planets around white dwarf is sort of very, I think, still a very open question of like who survives, who doesn't survive, how to migrate, how to orbits migrate. But um, yeah, so 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 for capturing like the peak of the star as well, right, in sort of the wavelength range that you're looking at, unless you want to take like the star as a constant, right, I think you're going to end up kind of end up looking at these cooler stars still. Um, gotcha. And, you know, to say nothing of like, what if there's like a debris disk or an actual like disk, right? And then you'd have to take that infrared access signal and also first check, is it a disk or not, right? Mm. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? I see Ravi coming off. Hey, Laura. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh, Avi has it. Um, so, have you or uh, anyone in the team tried to do this for the nearby uh, habitable zone planets around Amstras that we know we have some known targets? Like try to observe them, you mean? To, do uh, to, pi? to assess, no, to, to assess the Pi technique to see what to what level we would be able to see the infrared emission, uh, excess mm. infrared emission. Yeah, I haven't done a signal to noise analysis of every particular system, um, but we we are considering um, doing some actual like JVC data proving ground work to see if we can maybe do like a cycle three proposal to actually look at some of these nearby systems, looking for planets. And of course, there are some with a bunch of known planets, right? So there's sort of both both uh, tacks that you could take. Right, I'm sorry. I don't. I forgot to mention the non-transiting part. The nearby mm -hmm. non-transiting ones that we already know. That we already know are non-transiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a. That's like, the. Have, I think the perfect first step. Right. So we uh, we have uh, Subrat and others in our group who who you know can provide the targets and then if we don't have to actually observe them because we don't have a facility to do those kind of things right now. Mm -hmm. But if we can at least make an assessment of what would be the signal to noise ratio, we would be able to detect it. Uh, yeah. Is it, it's possible that would be great. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Let's chat about that. <laughs> Avi? Oh, I think you muted Avi. Hey, Laura. Great talk. Hi. A um, uh, couple questions that came up um, sort of after. Uh, uh, pondering this. Obviously, TRAPPIST, unlike the non-transiting systems, has transit constraints beyond, as well as radio velocity constraints, which both fed into EGOL and et al. And, and the other things. I was wondering if you attempted to do something where you, and, and maybe it just takes too much work, but you assumed that this was a, you have pictured TRAPPIST being a non-transiting system, and all we had was radio velocity constraints on the period and eccentricity, but maybe not as precise, or there were factors that weren't as well constrained, and, and then tried to see how that changed or adjusted your results. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, before we launched into this, let's just do it the way Trappist actually panned out to try to constrain all the tests we were doing. We did undertake tests like that and they're not gonna they didn't end up in the paper. Um, so I'll just tell you. But yeah, we tried we tried doing things like, you know, what if all my errors and all my parameters were bigger? Or what if I didn't put in the radius prior and just use the flat prior? Like how did things perform? Um and the the what ended up happening, right, is when you're blindly searching for a planet and you're like very thin major axis rate dominated, right? You end up trying to get that sort of like, or, you know, the model gravitates towards one big planet, like in the middle of kind of your range, right? So like, but you'd still get a planet, um, but, you know, in the sort of the the keep it simple, fewest parameters kind of thing, like you end up getting like one big planet in the middle of your possible thin major axis range. Um, and then of course, you know, because of the signals of each of these planets, right, you know, dropping one out of the system, you know, they they end up carrying that sort of that same importance with them as far as fitting the model. Um, and so like, if it was like just H, for example, right, like that's very different than doing just B um, yeah. for retrieving, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about rate of velocity is you get very precise variation in the gravitational impact and therefore the, you know, the orbital periods or at least some type of periodic signal. So you know that there's more periodic, more than one periodic signal, at least if you have enough SNR. So that could break if you knew, I don't know about Trappist, how much you would be able to get from just rate of velocity. But if you knew that there were five periodic signals, five planets in the system, and you knew the generally the orbital periods, but you didn't know obviously the radius or other factors, then you would have a constraint on the number of planets, but other things might be looser. Right, You'd, it would be sort of interesting. Yeah, Super yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we did those tests, and I it just didn't end up writing that up because it was yeah. There's too many rabbit holes, right? There like, are. There what are. If there's five. What if there's four? What if there's? Yeah, what if yeah. one is transiting and five are out or something? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all. And I got, I got messed up really fast. We had to like dial that back in <laughs> what we were actually testing. Next paper. No, next. Yeah, yeah. student or whatever. Um, yeah. My second. But question no, yeah, phases. Right, phases is the next thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My other question was just, of course, the next obvious question is atmospheres. Um, have you started thinking about how to expand this to at least consider like if you had one molecule or one factor, one atmospheric factor that you're trying to constrain um, from the actual black bodies beyond just the radius of the planets? And yeah, how... yeah. So we, we, of course, stuck it very simply, just testing, in this case, the like compactness and multi-planet systems. So of course, the next thing is atmospheres of planets and of course you know trap is one in particular the atmosphere of the star is very different from black bodies so adding those complexities is of course the next step and then you know actually considering orbital phase information and stuff like that would come naturally yeah so you are planning to work on that or yeah so, yeah okay cool i wasn't sure if you're like ah this is a too hard <laughs> too messy too many free parameters i don't want to deal with it but, um Awesome. Yeah. Sounds good. Great work. Awesome. Uh, do we have any other questions? Laura? All right. Well, if not, uh, thank you, Laura, again, for this great talk and great work. It, it was really cool to uh, hear it all laid out and going through the years and how things change when you look at the different uh, um, publications. Um, uh, I put uh, your email address in the chat. So if anyone uh, has any questions afterwards, please please feel free to reach out to Dr. Mayorga. But otherwise, we will leave it there. And thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Bye.